Elon Musk predicts people will be able to land on Mars by 2026. Factor cap. Ooh, that's tough. Can We're I, talking about four years from now. Yeah, it's a it's a flip of a coin, honestly. Okay. I think they have very good odds of doing it with their rapid uh, development, production, reusability. But I think it's going to take a long time for that vehicle to be human rated. Okay. So uh, in four years, it's a bit of a tall order. Um, so I'll say cap, but I would like to think it's fact. Welcome back, everybody, to Custom Journeys. I am Elisa Iglesias, and this is my podcast co-host, Andrew Baines. And we're here live from the West Houston Institute here at the Northwest campus of Houston Community College. We are Custom Journeys, and we are the pod that spotlights Black and Latino voices in STEM. And we're very happy to be here today. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, at Custom Journeys, that's C-U-S-T-E-M Journeys and can also visit our website at uh, www.customjourneys.com. We're really happy to have a highlight of a guest. All our guests are highlights, but today especially we have Emmanuel Alex Zamora, a NASA engineer, and he has a BS in electronics engineering from, from UTSA actually, and also a master's in aerospace, aeronautical, and astronautical engineering from Texas A&M University. He's also a professional engineer as well. Thank you so much, Alex, for being here today. Oh yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. Um, so just, I just wanted to clarify one thing. Um, uh oh, <laughs> we already screwed up. So I, already, I actually Eli. don't have a master's uh, in engineering. Um, I am working towards my master's, mm. so I don't have one yet. Um, but it's uh, hopefully in the works soon. Okay. So yeah, we, we have to call our research team and see what, what happened I'm there. sorry. I didn't it's mean to, okay. I, I didn't want to do that. We have a sophisticated research arm here at Custom Journeys. But no, but regardless, it's awesome, though. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being yeah, here. Yeah, happy to be here. Cool. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm really excited about this one. Um, as Eli said, we're at, this is our first one at like a different site other than our podcast host. So, uh, other, than, gonna, other than our bedrooms doing this virtually. We got we got a legit podcast studio now in the yes. Ion Center in yes, Houston. But right now we got about five to five or six students in the room with us. So I'm really glad that they're here to kind of get a sneak peek behind the scenes and kind of learn from you. Um, so yeah, we'll give you all a chance to ask any questions in a minute. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and kick it off. Well, before we get there, I just want to explain since we do have an audience that we're all engineers here. Uh, me and Andrew were both mechanical engineers. Andrew has a lot of uh, industrial experience. He worked at GM. I just finished my doctorate and PhD in mechanical engineering over at UT San Antonio, and we have a NASA engineer here in the middle. So uh, we all are very well versed in engineering talk, so feel free to ask all kinds of questions uh, when we can. Yep. All right, take it away. Thank you. Uh -huh. Man, so Alex, we always got to kick it off by talking about like where you're at now, right, currently. So you're at NASA, NASA is like a dream job for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people grow up wanting to be astronauts. Uh, you're an electronics engineer at NASA. What does that mean exactly? What's kind of like your your job and what's kind of like a day in the life for you? Absolutely, yeah. So um, like you mentioned, a lot of folks, uh, you know, wanted to be an astronaut as a kid. Uh, I definitely fall uh, in that category. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm just uh, really, again, glad to be here, uh, glad to be uh, doing what I'm doing. Um, so just a, a really brief overview of what it is I do. Um, uh, as Andrew mentioned, I am a what they call an electronics engineer. Uh, I have a um, interior title as well uh, as a subject matter expert uh, for all things uh, related to imagery um, when it comes to uh, different sorts of programs. Uh, right now, I am uh, specifically overseeing mission operations uh, for the International Space Station programs uh, with a special lens on imagery. Um, Along with overseeing some of the operations that goes on uh, in the International Space Station program, I'm also working with other programs such as the Artemis program, the Orion program, as well as the Gateway program uh, to develop uh, and make more concrete uh, different types of requirements for the Artemis program for going to the Moon and Mars. Um, the uh, a, a big part of my job also uh, involves maintaining uh, lots of old imagery as well. Um, and as a uh, NASA, as being a government entity and agency, we are by law required to provide and um, maintain 
these uh, imagery products for the National Archives uh, of the United States. So we're also in charge of all of that imagery. Um, there's this really cool vault um, that we can talk about a little bit later that houses all of the original Apollo imagery. Okay. And uh, I've actually gotten to see some of the Apollo imagery and how that uh, became from went from film to uh, digital media nowadays. Um, so it's really cool. Uh, I also have um, a background in mission operations. So I used to work in Mission Control Center uh, in what they call the Mission Evaluation Room, or MER, uh, supporting the uh, electrical power system console, uh, supporting the flight controllers directly. Uh, I used to support a console named Spartan. Uh, that was a really, really cool experience. I think that was uh, definitely an experience I'll never forget. So again, I'm just really glad to be here and, um, I, you know, giving you guys a glimpse of a little bit about what I do. Cool. All right, so you got to simplify it for me because, I mean, I'm an engineer, but I just kind of want to know some of the details behind it. Sure. So when you say imagery, are we talking about pictures of, like, rocks? Or are we talking about pictures of aliens? What are we talking about <laughs> exactly? I get the alien question quite a bit. Yeah. Um, it comes up, like, every time I, I, I talk to somebody. So thanks for keeping the street going. <laughs> <All right. laughs> oh, no. Uh, uh, so, no, yeah, so it's, it's everything. So with um, – Right now, the big focus is station, right? So uh, all of the science that goes on on, on station, um, everything from payloads to human spaceflight, right? So okay. a lot of uh, restricted imagery that goes on with like the crew, uh, all of their health, as well as Earth views and supporting the crew when they go EVA, right, outside the station and uh, to do uh, maintenance and support for station uh, and different things like that. So so imaging, it's not just static images, but also you're working on live recordings, live uh, moving Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, there's uh, a big component of it is our photos. Um, mm -hmm. We call that still imagery. still imagery, but there's also motion imagery, which is video. Right. And so, yeah, we absolutely capture all sorts of uh, live video as well as recorded video files. Mm -hmm. And so all of the infrastructure, all the ground infrastructure that takes to uh, process all that, handle all that, store all of that. Uh, to eventually that has to end, uh, end up with uh, NARA, the National Archives. Um, so. OK, very cool. One more one more question about your current position before we get into, like, what made you first interested in engineering? Sure. Um, so I would imagine NASA, like I said, is a dream job, but I would imagine that it's kind of demanding. Um, is that the case? Like, are you working 40 hours a week? Are you working more than that? What's kind of a, a day in life from a workload uh, standpoint? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah. So it, it is absolutely very demanding. Um, Definitely when I was working more on the mission operations side, it was a lot more demanding. We had a uh, on-call, different things like that. So okay. the way the schedule worked there was, yeah, we, um, so when I worked mission operations, I was a contractor for NASA. Um, and uh, we would have a, a week that we would work our console job. So we would go in early in the morning. Uh, if there was a shift before that, we had to go in a little bit extra early to get a handover from the previous console operator. And uh, after we would go home, we would be on call for that entire week. And so it's basically, you know, you can't really do a lot of things during that week because you're sort of tied to your phone. Um, and there were some cases where, you know, work, you know, 40, 60, 80 hours a week. Um, but definitely, if it's something you're passionate about, I mean, I definitely think that it's something that it, if it doesn't necessarily feel like work, it feels like just something that you have this uh, internal drive to get done definitely helps the the time go by a little bit faster of course it's exhausting but um, you know you, you make you make it work um, but now um, so now I'm, I'm what they call a civil servant so I'm a full-fledged uh, federal employee and so now things are a little bit different I'm more of a program project manager um, and so things are a little bit different now I manage some of the folks that do the mission operations day in and day out so it's a little gotcha. bit uh, different can you make a distinction for the audience here between contractor and federal employee, we'll call it? Sure. Cause, yeah. Cause you, you served in both roles while in NASA. Yeah, so um, th that, that's a unique question, definitely. I've never gotten that question before. Um, there are those cases where being a contractor and being, you know, a, a civil servant, the line gets a little bit blurred sometimes. Um, you know, some folks make the 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 comment that we're badgeless, right? Some, mm -hmm. um, we all serve the same role. We all support the same uh, mission. So in that, in that regard, it's, it's very, the, very much the same. Um, but from a managerial standpoint, it's very, very different. Um, because I mentioned I am a bit of a project and program manager. Mm -hmm. um, but 
at the end of the day, when I met, when I sort of give directions to some of the folks that I oversee, they have folks that they answer to as well. So, you know, if, for example, if uh, I were to have to give direction to some of the folks and their management disagrees, the folks that I gave the direction to won't come back and say, uh, with pushback, mm -hmm. their management will come back and work with me, right? And so it's it's a little bit more uh, bureaucratic, if you will, okay. um, much less, you know, boots on the ground. Gotcha. No, I think it's an important distinction to make because in any type of federal agency, you're going to have contractors and you're going to have federal employees. And so, but they're all serving similar roles. It's just the paperwork's different. Sure, <laughs> no, yeah. No, no, because, no, yeah, I, I've worked in an Army before and I had similar situations, but let's move on. <laughs> all right, cool. So um, that's, thanks for giving a good detailed background information about what you currently do. So you grew up down in the Valley. Yeah. Um, it was McAllen or where was it exactly? Uh, it was Brownsville. Brownsville, Brownsville Texas, the southernmost tip of Texas. Okay. <laughs> so growing up as a little boy in Brownsville, what made you decide to major in engineering in college? Sure, yeah. So um, I mentioned uh, before we started recording that I watched a few of the podcasts that you guys have recorded before. Yeah. And I think there's a common theme um, uh, with some of the folks that I watched, uh, with me included, being that, uh, you know, your upbringing has a big play into it. So, you know, my, uh, my parents were both uh, very hardworking individuals. Uh, they had their primary role and they had side gigs as well. Um, and so my dad, he was an accountant by day. And at the time, he was a, he was sort of like a software hardware engineer. So okay. he worked with a company to develop a POS system for a restaurant. And okay. at the time, I didn't know what that meant, right? I don't think a lot of, you know, four or five, six-year-olds do no. what a PO, <laughs> know what a POS system is. Um, but I always thought, oh, you know, my dad knows computers. I like computers. And, um, you know, I like video games also. Um, Star Wars, the movies. I'm a huge movie guy. Um, so Star Wars, all Star Trek, those all play like really, really influential roles for me as uh, growing up. And so that's kind of what kind of kicked off that idea of like, you know, I want to be, uh, you know, an adventurer, an astronaut, right, an explorer. And so when I was in high school, um, I'll be totally honest, I wasn't the best high school student. Um, We're talking about like C's no, and no doubt. Yeah, e just about, you know, okay. bar barely scraping by, okay. I, I would um, honestly say. And... You know, that was like a really, at the time, it didn't really matter much, right? Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, going to high school, no big deal. Um, it wasn't until I applied to college that, uh, you know, the real world slapped me in the face, quite literally. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so I remember applying to, I think we had like waivers uh, for the application fees. I applied to several different different universities and got denied by all of them. And Boy, okay. uh, all of them, UTSA included. And um, that was a really big eye opener for me. Wow. Um and at the time, uh, I was dating my girlfriend, which is not, uh, now my fiance. And, uh, you know, she kind of told me, you know, I'm, I'm going to San Antonio. And I'm going with or without you. <laughs> so I <laughs> said, get you your know, stuff together. Yeah, there's the line. Yeah. 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 And so that was sort of the nudge um, that I really needed to, you know, that, uh, you know, with other things uh, to get the ball rolling. So I thought, what's the one way I can make it out, um, you know, the, the community college uh, in San Antonio, San Antonio Community College, accepted me with open arms. Um, they took me in and they gave me a curriculum to, to run into. Um, uh, and there is where I really found uh, sort of my feet, uh, my feet beneath me. Um, I, I became, I started off, and, and I think there was another gentleman also that uh, was interviewed that he started sort of like in the the bottom end of the math uh, yeah. courses, right? Leo, yeah. Yeah, Leo, exactly, yeah. So I, I knew I wanted to do computers. I like computers. So I decided to go into computer science at first. And I was told, well, you got to do, you know, college algebra, uh, Cal 1, pre-Cal, Cal 1, Cal 2, all that stuff. And so I took a, the test to sort of, I think it was like a placement test, some sort of placement yeah, yeah. test. And they told me, you know, you got to get into remedial math. I thought, oh, That's great. The bottom. Yeah, great. Okay. And that, that was like a pass fail thing, right? Mm -hmm. There were no grades. It's just, did you get through it or not? And um, luckily I got through it, got into college algebra. And it wasn't until I got to trigonometry and pre-cal that there was this one professor uh, really just made everything click. I, I don't know how he did it. Um, his name is Hector Trevino uh, from um, Northwest Vista College out in San Antonio. Uh, Honestly, I can honestly feel like I, I really credit my whole uh, academic career to him. He really made math click. He made it 
so simple, so concise um, in a way that I think a lot of folks were able to understand. And, um, you know, I, I think that that point going to community college really was an inflection point in my life because I don't think I would have gotten that same quality of education um, in the university system, uh, if I may be totally honest. Um, so once I did get into uh, university, I was still a computer science major, and um, I was taking uh, one of the beginner programming classes, and we're talking, you know, like a sea of students, right? Uh, mm -hmm. 150 people to mm -hmm. one professor. And, um, you know, there I was just like, maybe, you know, computer programming isn't for me. And so I went to, to the to the advisor, the academic advisor, and I thought, you know what, I'll, I'm a very hands-on person. I like to... I, I, would, I make the joke that, you know, computer science was something that wasn't tangible. I couldn't touch it. Um, and I thought, what's the next big thing? Um, what's the closest thing to computer science, which I chose to be electrical engineering? And, um, yeah, man, that, that was the point that really set me, set me off on a, a course for success. Everything really made sense. Uh, everything was tangible. Uh, the labs were amazing, mm -hmm. uh, taught by really cool professors. And, yeah just kind of mm -hmm. went up from there shout out to alamo colleges northwest East absolutely for sure yeah. now th that was my follow-up and i think you answered it and that was did you have an academic advisor that was guiding you helping you form the curriculum that would best suited for what you wanted to do uh yes and no okay. um so uh when i was at northwest vista um i did have i guess a team of a academic advisors never just one uh, okay. point of contact mm -hmm. um that really you know guided me along but for the most part I, I would say that a lot of the the work was done by myself you know doing some research on you know what courses to take along with you know the degree plan that they set out so okay, okay. so I would imagine you said in high school you got like C's pretty average or below average yeah a lot of our guests have received like scholarships or student loans in your case how did you pay for college that you had to take out loans or how was it yeah so I was fortunate enough that my parents were able to help me um, but okay. I also did have to take out quite a few loans um, you know naturally so uh, that's sort of how I made it through through college and I did work in like different uh, odd jobs here and there uh, I did do some some time in some of the labs uh, at school so that's kind of what helped me through so Okay, cool. Um, and then you want to ask the last one before we end this segment, Eli, the job? One, one quick follow-up. Yeah. Uh, how many years did you spend in community, the community college system before transferring to UTSA? I spent about a year. Okay. So I graduated high school in 2011, and I think I transferred over to UTSA in 2012. Okay. So it was about a year. Okay. And I got most, if not all, my basics done there. So. And that process wasn't, how difficult was that process of transferring over? To transfer? Yes. It was pretty seamless. Okay. I'll, be, I'll be pretty honest. Um, I know the uh, Alamo Colleges works really closely with UTSA, as mm -hmm. I'm sure HCC works pretty closely with the University of Houston. Mm -hmm. So I'm, uh, the process was pretty seamless, uh, pretty pain-free. Um, okay. Yeah. No, Everything there, transferred. Everything transferred. They accepted all the credits. They sure did. Good. Yeah. That's great. Uh, last question for this segment. And then I think... Andrew, we can go to like maybe one student question. Yeah. Uh, how did you land? First of all, what was your first job out of college, and how did you land it? Sure. Yeah. Uh, do, do internships count? Or yeah, go for okay. it. Okay, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. So I actually had an internship over the summer, um, and I, it was down back home uh, in Brownsville. So there's a utilities company there down there called the uh, Brownsville uh, Public Ut Brownsville Public Utilities Board, um, and there. Uh, Honestly, uh, I think networking really, really helped me. Um, so I had a, uh, quite a few friends, right? Obviously, I went to school down uh, in Brownsville. And one of my friends was actually interning there, but he was more of like a permanent co-op intern. So he had been there for quite a few years. And I had told him, you know, hey, I want to do an internship down in Brownsville. And he goes, oh, well, I know like the, the HR representative that handles the internships. Let me see if, you know, maybe we can like help you out or something. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the, the last thing I heard from him. And, you know, coming from all of these like rejections and denial, my, my confidence was fairly low, right? Um, and I thought, you know, they're not going to want anything to do with me. And so uh, luckily I, I had a pretty good grades, right? Once I uh, got my footing, uh, I, I think I had like a 3.3 GPA uh, while I was uh, pretty much all throughout um, my undergrad. 
And uh, yeah, they gave me a call one day. They they had an interview set up for me. It was over the phone uh, since I was in San Antonio and they were in Brownsville. Um, and honestly, learning how to interview, I think, also really helped me. Um, that That is a skill that um, you definitely can't learn from a book, right? It's one of those things that where you have to really put... Um, and a phone interview is doubly challenging, I find. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I could go on for days about that, okay. right? Um, yeah, so learning how to interview, that's what really, um, I think, set me apart from other candidates. And I landed the, the gig down there. It was over the summer, so it was a three-month uh, in, uh, internship rotation uh, with uh, what they call the SCADA group, which it's an acronym, S-C-A-D-A, -A, uh, which is Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. And that was when I really found out, wow, like this is what I want to do. Um, I, I really, really enjoyed it. It was a lot of hands-on. It mm -hmm. was a lot of hands-off as well. Um, and honestly, I can honestly say I was very, very lucky to land where I landed because I could have landed in sort of like a transmission engineering, distribution planning, something like that. But to land there, I was, uh, I can't, I don't know. Perfect I, placement. I, for sure. Now, I, sh I should have put in more context. Did you get paid at your internship? Oh, yeah. Then, yes, it's a job. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, I did get paid. Luckily, thank you. No problem. For clarifying that. All right. I think we can t you want to take one or two? Yeah. Is anybody? So now we'll kind of open it up. Usually we don't do this, but since we're in person, we'll give you guys the opportunity for it. to ask any questions that you guys have. Let's go with the gentleman with the black tie. Since he oh, okay. So my question is, Elio, was uh, your job in NASA, did you have an internship with them? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so go ahead, John. Are you gonna repeat it? Yeah, the question was, at your job at NASA, did you get it through an internship? That's a great question. Um, no, so I, I know a lot of folks. That is how they find um, their way into NASA. Um, they they have a NASA has a program called the the Pathways program, which in a sense picks up uh, some of the folks that are either in their early uh, college career or in their later college career, and they. Uh, progress them through a co-op situation where they do uh, different types of uh, rotations. Um, but because I got my first job as a contractor, um, I did not do a uh, internship with that contractor. So um, when when I got my civil servant role, um, I got it by just applying through the normal uh, process. Now, how did you, as a follow-up, that might be another avenue as well to work for NASA is through some of the contracting companies that work or collaborate with them. Would you say that'd be a good strategy? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think the, the contractor, the contracting community um, at NASA is huge and it's super diverse. Um, they do a lot of the boots on the ground work is what I like to call it. Uh, sort of the real hands-on uh, engineering and, and operations. And so there's actually a website that you can look up uh, are who all the contractors are uh, for NASA. And when you look them up, uh, they have tons and tons of jobs. I mean, literally, I get alerts. Uh, I'm still signed on for the alerts on Glassdoor and, uh, and LinkedIn as well. And I get emails, uh, like, I get like three in the morning and three in the evening. So mm -hmm. the jobs are abundant for sure. Okay, cool. Anybody else, real quick, go ahead. <clears throat> My name is Abdul, I'm a career service specialist at HCC. I just want to actually emphasize about a couple of things that you mentioned and I have a question too. First is that you actually did mention that you didn't just stop, but you actually enrolled and start taking classes. And that's something that I've noticed that a lot of students feel so stuck at the beginning because um, they always you know, reach out, they're not sure what major they want to pick, and it's very important to start taking classes in order for you to, like, to be able to tell what kind of you know, classes you enjoy and then start, you know, pursuing that major. And also that you mentioned that you did um, a, a co-op or a internship, mm -hmm. because also a lot of people I notice uh, do get like, you know, so caught up, to, uh, you know, trying to pass classes and, you know, do um, academic related things and they don't uh, use uh, these opportunities. My question for you is you did mention that you did practice interviewing. Uh, do you mind just telling us some tips that you did to improve your interviewing skills? Oh, that's a really great question. There are a lot of resources online uh, definitely YouTube is the place I think to really get a lot of advice on how to do interviews and I sort of take the approach to where I'll just take as much information I can get I'll jot it down and then I'll go by and just eliminate things that I, I 
don't necessarily feel like I need. And ultimately, I think to practice the actual act of interviewing, uh, just use your family. Um, I think at the time I used, you know, my mom and dad, uh, you know, talk to my girlfriend about it and have sort of um, a set of mock interview questions. Mm -hmm. I was also a part of an organization um, at UTSA. Uh, they were called the IEEE. Okay. Uh, All right. And they also held different events, um, a a along with other organizations on campus that held mock interviews. Some of them even had um, folks from the industries come out, uh, you know, one, I think, yeah, and have mock interviews and different things like that. So definitely practice, 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 and perseverance. I cannot stress that enough. Um, yeah. And definitely if there's somewhere where you want to get to, if you try hard enough for long enough, you'll get there. I, I definitely think so. Thank you. Cool. Oh, right, yeah. We'll do one more yeah. and then we'll go, go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, so my question was is for landing a job or a position at NASA, do you believe, what do you think helped you the most? The experience, network, or was it just luck? What was it that really just helped you? Yeah, I think uh, that, that's a great question. I think it's a combination of all three, honestly. Definitely having the right experience. Uh, NASA is a very specialized and technical uh, area. Um, and definitely the more, if, if uh, well, I guess we're all engineers here, right? The more hands-on you can get, uh, the better. So uh, as I mentioned, I had an internship where I was very hands-on. Um, that really helped, as well as my role coming out of college. That was also very hands-on. Uh, as well as networking. Um, there was a few guys that I met when I was uh, in college that uh, were co-op uh, interns, Pathways interns at NASA. And, you know, I would follow up with them every now and then. And um, I think it, w it was a networking event where I found the right person at the right time. So I actually got a hold of one of the managers um, at the company that I worked at. And uh, they were looking for an engineer at that point. They said, send me your resume. And after that, we had a, an interview. And also, I had some extracurricular activities, if you will. So at the time, I had also taken what they call the Fundamentals of Engineering exam, which is the FE. Mm -hmm. um, and I took that right out of college. And that, to him, was very, very impressive. And so that led me to also pursue my professional engineering uh, license. And um, that's doing, I guess, going above and beyond sort of you know, what the cookie cutter student is kind of doing um, that also with uh, a lot of luck I think um, but you know there, there's that saying right where it's like the harder I work the luckier I got right yeah you make your own luck yeah in some so ways. yeah I'm sorry that's a kind of a big uh, answer but <laughs> <laughs> all right cool so now we'll move on to our second segment this one if you've been watching the show is probably you have probably haven't seen this one yet this one is called factor cap there'll be a mix of like professional development questions and then also some silly questions in here so um so factor cap if you don't know is basically true or false if it's true say fact if it's false say cap um for each question that i ask you got 60 seconds or less to answer it okay so you have to answer factor cap and then you can give like a brief explanation for it okay all right no pressure okay <laughs> that's gonna be fun it's gonna be am fun. i gonna get fact checked uh, no, it's, it's, it's not even like that. It's all based on your opinion, really. Oh, okay. It's not like, yeah. It's not like when did the Mars rover okay, land on. Okay. Yeah, not like that. All right, so we'll, we'll start it off um, kind of easy. So you mentioned that you have a, you, you took the fundamentals of engineering exam, and then you took the PE, the professional engineering license exam. I've typically seen civil engineers get a PE. It's more common for them. Mm -hmm. As an electrical engineer, is it factor cap? It's the PE is worth the struggle absolute fact I think um, and that's definitely my opinion because I have a lot of friends who disagree um, but yeah you know that that's something that's totally true a, a lot I was I had a lot of civil engineer friends when I was uh, at UTSA I think the civil engineering program is actually really really big down there yes, um, and yeah they are mo more of the folks that take the uh, the PE and they, they uh, do all that um, but honestly I guess it I sort of take back my my fact uh, answer to where it, it depends. Are you changing your mind? No, I'm not. I'm not necessarily <laughs> changing my mind. <laughs> I'm messing with you. But uh, yeah, it just depends. So, at the time, I was working for uh, the public, right? I was working at a utilities company, providing our services to the public, and so that was the only way up the ladder. Okay. So, I, fun fact, I guess legally in Texas, you can't call yourself an engineer unless you don't have your PE license. 
Did you know that? I did not know that. Did not know that. You might be in trouble, Andrew. I lived in Michigan while I was in industry, so I might be exempt from that. I've been in academia, so it's it's all good. Cool. All right, next one. Factor cap. It's not what you know, but who you know. So in other words, your network is more important than your skills. I'd say that's cap. Cap. Skills are more important? For sure. Okay. All right. Cool. Definitely. All right. Next one. Factor cap. LinkedIn is the best way to network with people. Cap. Cap. Maybe right. maybe nowadays, all right, because we're all you know virtual. Yeah. But nothing beats, nothing beats this right here, right? Okay. Nothing no. beats being in person, getting to know each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but staying in touch with folks, now that may be fact, right? LinkedIn is really really good uh, to stay in touch with folks, especially you know if you meet some uh, different folks from the industry, you don't necessarily like have their number. Yeah. But if you have them on LinkedIn, yeah. send them happy birthday or something. You know. All right. Stay I like in the that. back of their mind. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Next one, uh, factor cap, college should be free. Mm, I like this question. That's a tough one. Um, I would say cap, honestly. Really? Okay. Yeah. Because for the for the fun, the, and this is a totally personal, uh, experienced answer. So I feel like I didn't take high school seriously because it was free. <laughs> okay. That's and it wasn't budget. until I had to pay my way, right, with student loans, get in debt, yeah. mm-hmm. to really be like, yo, this matters. Like, if I don't do this, I just wasted, you know, mm-hmm. four or five grand. That's that's a lot of money, right? So. Okay. Cool. So I, I got yours is a little bit longer than usual. I got three questions. These are all like NASA, SpaceX. I want to add one more at the very end. Okay. So, so we got go four. Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So, Factor Cap, you work in NASA, aliens exist. Oh Fact. Gosh. Okay. Statistics will tell us they're bound to exist. That's my argument. Okay. Mic drop. Mic drop. Universe cool. is way too big. Yeah. All right. Next one. Uh, so Elon Musk predicts that humans will live or be able to, first of all, he predicts people will be able to land on Mars by 2026. Factor cap. Ooh, that's tough. Can We're talking I, about four years from now. Yeah, can I make my answer at the end to tell you why I feel a certain way? Yeah, 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Okay. Yeah. I think it can go either way. It's a it's a flip of a coin, honestly. Okay. He has very good... I think they have very good odds of doing it with their rapid uh, development, production, reusability. But I think it's going to take a long time for that vehicle to be human rated. Okay. So uh, in four years, it's a bit of a tall order. Um, so I'll say cap, but I would like to think it's fact. Okay. One more, and then Eli has another one. Um, another Elon Musk prediction. He predicts that humans will be able to live on Mars in, by 2060. Fact or cap? And I know that's kind of hard to... I like to think that's true. Okay. I like to think that's a fact. Cool. All right. To round out this rapid fire session, this is a very critical question might affect our friendship. Oh. That's, I know we, we just started our friendship today, but we'll see. Okay. San Antonio has the best tacos. Fact or cap? Cap. 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 Man. You better say your mom's restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Boy. Man. That's a super biased question. No, it is. That's it's a super, a, biased, a super question. biased question. Have you, so, have you tried tacos from all over Texas? or just Not all over. All over yeah, yeah, not all over. So, um yeah, I, I mean, I'm obviously biased to, like, what I grew up mm-hmm. with, right? But mm-hmm. San Antonio does have some some mean places, right? Some really good places. Um, but the breakfast tacos. Not going to be able to do it? Non San Antonio. All right. Non San Antonio. Some, there's something going on in the valley, the second valley. Oh, yeah. I'll yeah. give you a tour. Yeah. Food, right. food tour. Okay. Cool. <laughs> All right. All right. So that concludes our second segment, Factor Cap. Our, after this, our next segment will be professional development. Uh, talk about salary, salary negotiation. But let's, let's open up to. Yeah, I want to give you guys a chance to ask any more questions that you guys may have, real quick. Anybody got any more questions before we go on? So you said that you are right now you're pursuing a master's degree. Do you do you believe or think that getting a master's degree is really important in furthering your career or like working at a top company? Is that something they value? I think it depends. Honestly, um, it depends definitely what industry you'd like to go into. The reason why I would like to do it is because I've been told in the past that I'm not very well rounded in terms of my skills. Um, and by that, it's it's mostly I've focused too much on electrical engineering, which is a bit ironic because that's what my degree is in. Right. 
Um, but sort of in the field that I'm in, they expect a lot of folks to be uh, constantly learning uh, about not just your own field, but everybody else's. And b having that awareness is, you know, uh, unmatched anywhere else. So my degree is, uh, I plan to go into aerospace. So I'm, I'm actually not going into electrical to get that more well-roundedness, right? But that could just be an artifact from my industry and my experience. Because I can definitely tell you when I worked in the utilities industry, um, the PE was more important than uh, a master's degree for sure. Just to piggyback off that, it seems like the theme is it depends on what the position values and what the company organization values. If they value PEs, if they will value people that are more well-rounded, then that might be what your target needs to be. Absolutely. Okay. So kind of reverse engineer it. Yeah. Think about what's your end goal yeah. and then figure out what's going to help you to get there. That's kind of the takeaway. You, you had a question no. first and then him. Like what, software and things what like software. that. What um, software? So I actually don't think I'm allowed to talk about what vendors we use. Um, okay. I'm not sure if I am or not, so I'd rather just lay on the on and the side. side. We're, yeah, on the side we're not. Um, but I can tell you, you know, the types of hardware we use. Uh, th that's pretty well known. So we use uh, all sorts of uh, Sony and Canon, uh, different types of cameras, and uh, a lot of that stuff is uh, transmitted over the. I think the. Uh, there, there's satellites up in uh, geosynchronous orbit um, that they're called TDRS satellites. So that's how uh, station communicates with uh, ground stations. So all of that uh, data, that data is packetized into what we call a, a transport stream. It's encapsulated and sent over to uh, our White Sands test facility, mm -hmm. which I believe is out in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and we have some uh, lines uh, over to Johnson Space Center. So that might be Nevada. But I'm not sure. It to, might be, yeah. I have to fact check that. Yeah. Okay. Can you yeah. give an example, like a just commercial software that's out there that everyone knows about? So I'm very new to the world of imagery. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so I couldn't give you uh, more so an example of what we use. But I, I think the question of what software do you we use, uh, I could maybe answer, ask a follow-up question as to what exactly you mean by that. Because... I mean, we obviously use a lot of different things like uh, tools that a lot of folks uh, use every day, right? Like uh, Photoshop uh, to stitch different photos together uh, to enhance different colors and different things like that. So uh, definitely use that. Um, like MATLAB, C++, Python, would uh, that be used for imagery too? Uh, MATLAB for sure. Uh, definitely. I, I use MATLAB in, in my undergrad. Uh, we actually programmed a sensor, which I guess is, is related to imagery, and we definitely use that uh, to extrapolate data. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely all of the, uh, those underlying programming languages are definitely used, uh, probably not on the uh, interface end of the uh, with the user, but definitely in the back end, right, uh, where those programs are developed and the environment that they're, they're made. We're at the 40-minute mark. Okay. So we'll, we'll kind of... Push through. push through it. So first question. So um, I like to talk about money a lot on the podcast. Uh, that was really one of the main things that made me decide to go engineering route. Mm -hmm. uh, once I found out it was one of the higher paying careers out there. Yeah. Um, so while you were talking earlier, I had to do a quick glass door search at NASA and find out like what's the average salary for an engineer. Yeah. Um, according to glass door, the average salary is about one hundred and five thousand dollars. So, of course, that's like the high end, the low end and then the average. Um, in your experience, what's the typical salary that an engineer could make at NASA? Uh, so again, that's another one of it depends. Uh, so civil civil servant roles, uh, being a federal employee, are a lot different from a contracting uh, area. So if we want to talk about salary ranges, uh, when I was a contractor, uh, I made from the seventy to eighty uh, mark. Okay, and you know. I think it was like a very, very nice, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, pay range. So they they gave us, you know, all sorts of really, really good benefits that were very uh, competitive with what the federal government offers. Uh, but they also gave us something that uh, we don't have as a federal employee. So they used to give us, well, as a contractor, they gave us bonuses and, uh, nice. you know, different incentives for uh, different things. Um, and so now with the federal government, uh, the range is a lot higher but they don't offer those different types of, of incentives. So, yeah, I think that's a that's a very good uh, mark. 100. Okay. Yeah, give oh, or take. Right. Cool. So, and you touched on this already a little bit, but maybe you can go into detail. 
as much as you're able to the process of applying uh, at a job at NASA? Yeah. So uh, for the civil servant role, um, those are actually really, really easy. Um, there is a website called usajobs.gov. Um, and there you sort of have to make your government uh, resume and you have you upload your transcripts to it. Um, the caveat there is that you have to be eligible for the role that you're applying to. So some roles are, a lot of roles are internal to the agency or other government agencies. Mm -hmm. However, recently there's been quite a few open to the public. Um, so just, uh, you know, keep, keep an eye out for that. Also, uh, when building your resume in that uh, government um, website, I think it's really important to really dissect the job description and sort of take a lot of those keywords mm -hmm. and pepper them into your um, resume and sort of tailor fit it to get it to really, really match what the job wants. Okay. Strategize your tech. Right. Yeah. yeah. Be strategic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. We'll take, go ahead and take a follow up here. Um, I just have one question. When you said you have to be eligible, is this like a citizenship status? Like, uh, do NASA hire people who are like who have DACA or TPS? Do they give them opportunities or like you know internships, uh, sponsorships? So I have very uh, limited information on that. However, I do know that a lot of jobs are open. A lot of NASA jobs are only open to U.S. citizens only. However, I have seen time and time again the uh, option to, uh, I, I guess the question that if, if you are a U.S. citizen or you are not, I'm not sure exactly how it works, um, whether you will require sponsorship in the future. So I'm sure that those options are available to some degree. Right. Yeah. Usually when you look at these positions, they'll have listed there the requirements yeah. of those types. Okay, now let's loop back to uh, your PE. Oh. What's the process of getting a PE? What's the process? Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so for the PE, uh, I think recently in Texas, um, they passed a, I'm not sure if it's a rule or, it's just a way to decouple the experience portion of the PE um, by completing your FE, your Fundamentals of Engineering exam. So uh, once you take and pass your FE, you are decoupled from having that four years of experience uh, to take the professional engineering uh, exam and to, uh, yeah, just to take the exam. So you can literally, the way I did it is I took my PE, I think it was in 20, or my FE in 2018, April of 2018, and I took the PE in October. So I went like back to back. Wow. Um, and honestly, I think that really played to my advantage because everything was so fresh, right? Right. And even right out of college, um, you sort of, when you don't tend to use the fundamentals that you learn in college, like Ohm's Law, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, basic circuit analysis, mm -hmm. right? I guess for you guys, it's F equals MA, right? That's it, yep. Yeah. Ohm's Law is the only thing I remember from he's, anything. I, circuits magic, I don't or really like, he's, cool. he's throwing shade a little bit. <laughs> and it's fine, cool. though. It's cool. Well, you want me to whip out the dirt plus water equals mud? Don't no. do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, I, I, I kid. But but yeah, so all of those fundamentals were really, really fresh, really, really, um, uh, you know, I had just used them a few months ago, kind of sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I applied, or I, I applied myself, I took the, the FE, and I passed it. Unfortunately, they don't tell you if you pass with flying colors, it's just a pass fail. But if you fail, I think they do give you a breakdown of how you did to okay. improve. Um, and yeah, the, the FE is is really, really, it's a little bizarre. So it's all fundamentals, as the, the title implicates, um, but they have a lot of uh, caveats to when you take the test. You can only take a specific calculator in. Right. You can't take any writing utensils. They give you like a writing pad and different things like that, which you can't erase on that writing pad, which is kind of, a, yeah, I wasn't a huge fan of that. But uh, when I took the PE, I actually took a course uh, to help me prepare for the PE. Um, okay. So uh, I paid for that course, um, and they also provided uh, materials. Because for the PE, when it, it was in person, I think now they're transitioning to online. Okay. Um, but you can take any material, any book you want, any and as many. All right. So <laughs> it was actually kind of funny because we mentioned it a little bit earlier how there was a lot of civils that take uh, mm -hmm. yeah. the PE. 
I literally saw guys with, you know, a dolly, a big old dolly. Oh, my goodness. With filing cabinets. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was it was insane. And I think those guys were the transportation guys. So you can imagine, right? There's mm-hmm. a lot of legislation, a lot of rules right. that, you know, you would have to just reference and not necessarily have to know off the top of your head. Yeah. Um, luckily for me, I think I took maybe six books total. Um, and I probably used every single one of them. And I also created my own... Um, Sort of like a crash course, you know, um, like a one 101. Page. Yeah, one pagers yeah. for a lot of things. I had them in a binder. And I think the rule to that is it can't be handwritten. So I just made a copy of it, punched okay. holes in it, and put it in my in my <laughs> binder, right? And so th- that was really cool. Um, gotcha. Really, really interesting experience. And luckily I passed um, the PE on my first try. Um, I think the highest pass rate is on your first try, and it goes down exponentially after that. Um and then I had to wait for my experience requirement to actually apply for the PE license. Oh, okay. So there's another experience thing that you can't really do anything about other than wait, right? And so the important thing I have, the only advice I have for engineers that are pursuing the PE is to document everything that you do. So the, to apply for the PE, uh, you have to uh, submit something that they call an SER, which I think is a su- supplementary experience record. Okay. And there you have to really characterize all of the calculations that you did to show the, to the board that you are uh, fit to perform engineering duties and have engineering judgment. So okay. that was really, really unique. Um, I really, it was, it, it, it was a pain in the butt to, to, <laughs> to get that done. But looking back at it now, I, I, mean, you know, I have that document forever. I'll never forget what I did in detail, mm-hmm. excruciating detail. Right, I got gotcha. uh, right. And my first few jobs, so. Well, that, real quick, that documentation thing is really important though, not only from a PE standpoint, but from a standpoint of like, when you start working in industry and you wanna, um, when you're up for like a raise or you wanna negotiate a new bonus or a higher pay increase, you wanna be able to document like, hey, this is what I did this year. These are the goals that we had for me. And then this is how I exceeded those goals. So that's just a piece of advice that, um, I don't know if you've had that same experience throughout your career, but Absolutely. one of my mentors told me that. Um, so for these guys, and also, actually, this is for anybody who's listening. Um, a lot of times when you're transitioning from high school to college, college to industry, um, you're always trying to figure out, like, hey, what do I want to do next? What's the next big step for me? What advice would you give for people in terms of, like, how to figure out what career path to take? Like, you've made a pretty good career out of going from CPS to contract to NASA to whatever you do next, but... How, what advice would you give for others who are still trying to figure out, like, hey, should I go this way, that way, or what? Mm-hmm. That's a really good question. Um, that's kind of tough. So, again, it's one of the, the – your mileage may vary. It depends on you, right? Um, but have a clear, concise end goal. So I definitely have one in mind. Um, that's something that I've always wanted to do ever since I've watched, uh, you know, all those, like, space movies, excluding Star Wars because they didn't have them in there. But the realistic – right movies um so uh my end goal is i would love to be a flight director that's something that i i've worked with flight directors they are some of the most uh just captivating folks i don't know Mm -hmm. there's something about them and they command respect by just being in a room it's it's really weird And, and most folks that haven't been through that probably don't know what i'm trying to say but um, that's something that I would like to do. Um, and so a lot of flight directors are civil servants. And so working in the ops community, I thought maybe if I get into a civil servant role, that will uh, potentially position me uh, better than somebody that isn't when it comes to time to apply for a flight director. Um, and and But the thing, the big thing there is um, having that those relevant skills, right? Mm-hmm. So... Um, any advice that I would give to somebody is uh, that's pursuing their, their goal is to have a clear end game, right? Um, and even if it's a moving target, right, you can always change your mind later. That's my next follow-up. Can yeah. the end goal change? Absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, th- that's just with what I think of now. But mm-hmm. it's, you know, to just piggyback on that flight director role, it's a very demanding role. Mm-hmm. It's very high stress, right? And... I think about it now as I, I want one, I want a job like that, but maybe when I, you know, get married and have children, I could, my, my priorities might change. Right, right. And therefore, my career outlook might change as well. So as long as, you know, you have something in mind to work to. Can you describe 
really quickly what a flight director does. Sure, yeah. So a flight director, the way the way it was described to me back when I took a tour of NASA was pretty kind of kind of cool, was they're the most important person in the room. If the president of the United States walked into mission control, the flight director can kick them out. That's okay. kind of cool. Really? Yeah. So that's not why I want to be one, by the way. Okay. <laughs> it's not this like power c- control grab thing that I'm into. No. Okay. Um, so basically, they are the last line of defense for the crew, and they make all of the decisions in real time. For example, if there is an issue with the crew while they're EVA or even doing different things inside, right, the, the flight director is in the know of everything, and they are sort of the manager managing all of the different console teams, getting their work done, and having the Capcom, which sits right next to them, communicate that over to the crew to get them to do uh, things in a in the most uh, strategic way possible. And so the, the other way I like to think of flight directors is they buy risk, right? There's never going to be a decision that they're going to make that is zero risk. So having that um, ability to assess and weigh risk mm-hmm. is, is a, a skill that, again, you can't learn from a book. So um, it, that, that's kind of what a flight director does, I think, in a nutshell. All right. Okay. We've got two more questions, um, or one more question before the big picture question. Um, what do you think has been the most impactful thing for you throughout your career? And this could be either college or your, your industry career. It can be a scholarship, a conference you went to, a piece of advice or anything like that. What do you think has been most impactful for you? Most impactful? Yeah. Definitely the folks that I've met along the way. Okay. Um, I've met, I've, I've had the privilege of working with some amazing people and w- aspiring to be like them, mm-hmm. I think really has, has changed my outlook on my career and how I just live my life day to day. So taking advice from, if there's somebody that you admire and that you are really close with and there's things about them that you like, you know, sort of internalize those things and make them yours and, and put your spin on them. And so that's actually one of the things that I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit later, I think, with the... with the Big picture question? Yeah, with the big picture. He's okay. done his research, yeah, so he knows the Watch flow. the show. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we get there, I'd like to go ahead and open it up again to the audience if they have any questions for Alex. I had a question based off of LinkedIn profile because you made mention to it. Yeah. And I wanted to know how do you manage yours in a way it's more professional? How do I manage mine? Like, how do you build your LinkedIn profile, you mean? Okay. Because I do have one right now, but I'm just starting up. Still college, not so much in it. And I want to know what you, your main focus on your LinkedIn profile is. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would think my main focus for my LinkedIn profile, personally, is to quantify uh, all of my experiences, right? So an example can just be, you know, well, I've worked on, on you know, XYZ software or I've worked on XYZ hardware. To me, that's very vague. And to maybe a recruiter or a hiring manager, that's very vague. I, the way I like to manage mine is say, I did XYZ for this type of hardware. And I could maybe even have a couple of bullets below beneath that and say, you know, the type of calculations that I did, the type of algorithms I've developed, um, maybe even the type of managerial things that I've done, right? Because uh, working with a team is just as difficult as, <laughs> you know, doing different engineering things to mm-hmm, day to day. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. My next question is, so how do you know what are you going to, like, I, I know you said you have an end goal, but how do you determine what you're going to do next? Like, you said you're not just going with the flow. You decided you want to do FE, then BE, then you're working on your master's. A lot of people just, you know, don't know what to do next because, you know, they want to get master's because they have a gap on their resume. So, you know, they, they're taking that because, you know, they want to get a higher pay. So what's a good way to motivate someone or to like give them guidance on what, what should be their next step? Oh, that's a tough one. I'm lucky that I guess NASA and like the area that I'm in is very structured to where there's very clear steps. But something that you mentioned where some folks decide to go get their master's or do different things to uh, fulfill a gap, that gap is identified because they have an end goal, I think, I would like to think, right? So, for example, if you're saying, well, maybe I'm not getting a job because I don't have my master's degree, right? Um, that could be a goal t- too, right? It doesn't have to be so hyper-focused on, 
I want to be a flight director or I want to be a, uh, you know, an engineer at NASA or whatever. It, it can also just be like as, as general as I just want to get a job, right? So I think it, it's sort of a matter of perspective and, um, you know, maybe your own goals and your own interests. I just want to add to that, that I think it's perfectly okay to not know what your end goal is and to, but at the same time, actively have experiences, internships, jobs that allow you to inform your abilities, inform your preferences. Mm -hmm. So you can, you don't have to say, I want to be a flight director, but what is it like to be a flight director? Or what is it like to work in operations? Right. And that might better inform what your end goal is going to be. Because a lot of students, especially when I was young, I had no clue what my engineering degree was going to lead me Your into. My end goal is to graduate. Exactly. My end goal, yeah. my end goal is to graduate. You're but because, because I did internships during my, my experience, and I don't want to make this about me, but uh, that informed my preferences. So I just want to add that. No. Yeah. Uh, no I was going to add, so like as an engineer in the industry, you guys are going to have to like reverse engineer or something. So you got an end product, you're going to have to take it apart and see how it's made and how it is able to do whatever it does. So you can do the same thing with your career. So like, let's say you know you want to be a flight director. You can go online, look at the job description, and see, hey, they say they want you to have a master's or a PhD. And then also, if you if there's somebody that you know out there, maybe you don't, maybe you don't know anybody at Google, but you want to work at Google, go on LinkedIn and type in Google in the search and look at people that work there and then look at what, is their, what does their job history look like do they have a bachelor's and a master's? Do they have a certain type of certification or things like that? So just kind of think about that. Like, think about it as like a a puzzle, a puzzle or a problem you're trying to solve, but it's your career mm -hmm. in this state. If you know what the end goal is. To me, the hardest part is if you don't know what you want to do. And then you got to figure out what do you like, what are you interested in. Mm -hmm. So, but I also have a, I also have another thing to add, um, and this reminds me of one of my uh, former coworkers where. He decided to go off, break off from being operations to being pro, uh, the project management area. And I asked him, I said, do you think you're going to like it? And he goes, you know, I don't know. I haven't done enough to know what I like and I don't like. So sometimes it just takes the leap of faith to just do things that maybe you're going to like, maybe you're not, right? And unfortunately, that's just like the reality of what it is that, us professionals go through, right? You guys included. Um, but who knows? It might be something that you didn't think you were going to like and you loved. Yeah. I like, I take something from my mom said, uh, no, hay, no, no hay mal que por bien no venga. There's no bad that without good comes. So even if you work at a job and it's a bad experience, there's always something to learn. Why was it a bad experience? What was bad about it? What was good about it? Mm -hmm. So in everything you do, from your career, always try to learn something even though it doesn't work out. Now, if you look at our previous episodes, I go into detail what went wrong in my career and also in Andrew's. So our, our careers weren't linear, they were very nonlinear. And that's one of the highlights of this pod so far is that so many people have had nonlinear careers. Go ahead. Can you share a very short story about a nonlinear career? Um, uh, yeah. Maybe, uh, well, what do you think? One thing real quick, that's just a good, what you said was a good segue to plug the podcast. If yes. you guys haven't, please subscribe to us on YouTube. It's Custom Journeys, C-U-S-T-E-M Journeys. Um, do you, how long is your linear story? Is it like a minute? 10 seconds. Go ahead. Go for it. Go for it. So basically, I did graduate during COVID, and you know, not a lot of people were hiring. That actually, people were losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I wanted to pursue a master's degree, but then I thought I'm going to be overqualified because I don't have that much experience, and I'm going to have so much... Um, like you said, skills or they so much expectations. So what I did is I actually got a career service specialist job because I was like, I can help myself get a job. So, you know, I and I actually did get a job, which is I'm going to start Monday. So congratulations. congratulations. Thank you. I just wanted to share that, that, you know, I couldn't find a job. So I, you know, finding a job is a full time job. So this, this is basically what I did. And that's why I wanted to ask that question about like, what if your end goal is not there yet? What can you do meanwhile? That's awesome. What, what, what's your job real quick? What's it going to be? A PV designer uh, for a solar company. Awesome. Oh, which is a mechanical, but that's more electrical, but they did hire me, so it's great. Uh, sun run, shout out for Sun run. Awesome. Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, congratulations. Congrats. All right. You want to take us home? Yeah, Eli? let's 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 take it home here. So, Alex, we've been talking for almost an hour. We probably can talk for another hour. But uh, one of the highlights, or one of the hard questions, the first one is the salary question, but the second hard question has to do with 
how do we address the inequities in STEM? So we want, us and Andrew, we would love to see a world where uh, the workforce looks like the people in this room, right? Multiracial, multigender, et cetera. In your opinion, from your experience, what is the best way to address this inequity? The best way to address the inequity? Yeah. I think it's just to have open conversations like this. Um, I am a firm believer in communication is key and it solves a lot of problems that didn't have to be problems. And so I definitely think having com open conversations like this, being able to you know, express your what you like and don't like, not being afraid to talk about salary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a really big push for that right now and I'm all for it. Um, <laughs> Definitely, there's a lot of uh, there's a huge push for females in STEM. I think that's something that's amazing. Some of the best managers, leads that I've ever had were females, and honestly, I owe them my career. I mean, these these women are some of the strongest, most just commanding women I've ever met, and um, yeah, I I really really think that's awesome, and definitely. I, I think it depends on the industry, but uh, I think more and more industries are leaning towards a more diverse workforce, and I think that's great. Um, everybody has a unique thing that they bring uh, to the table, and I think uh, you know having that cultural diversity can only make it better. So that's what I think uh, can really, really help uh, to increase diversity in STEM. Uh, just make it more applicable, make it more appealing uh, to all sorts of different cultures, backgrounds, um, as well as having that open communication. Gotcha. All right. And on that note, thank you for joining us today. It was a pleasure talking to you. It was a pleasure learning from you. Yeah. Honestly, learn some tips and tricks maybe I'll take, take home. And before we close out, is there anyone or anything you want to shout out? Um, no, I, I just, uh, I just want to thank you guys for having me. Um, this cool. has been a really, really cool experience. Uh, I hope uh, everybody in the audience had like a good, I, I answered your questions and if not, feel free to, you know, shoot me a message. We can talk afterwards if you want. Um, I love being here. I love sharing um, anything you guys want. Uh, I'm, I'm an open book, especially when it comes to my career. Uh, Cause I definitely, like you mentioned, I haven't had the most linear. If in fact it's been totally non-linear mm -hmm. and um you know, I still look back in moments of self-reflection and I'm really, really happy. And to just be here and be able to share with anybody, um, I really appreciate it. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, you're the first live guest and that comes with it a big honor. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's our pleasure. We've had a lot of fun. So um, always welcome to come back and we'll, we'll be in touch with you. So uh, thanks again for coming on. Um, yeah, for, for Custom Journeys, I'm Eliseo. This is Andrew and we're out of here. Peace.